So hi everybody, my name is Tom Wilkinson. I'm a researcher with the Leicester Kidney Lifestyle Team um, at the University of Leicester. Um, I'd like to thank Zoe for inviting me to, to give this talk um, or make this video. Um, I'm using a free version of um, the software Camtasia, um, I think it is, um, and I think it's got a watermark on the, on the slide, so hopefully it won't interfere um, with the presentation too much. Um, so uh, Zoe, when she emailed me, said I could really talk about anything. Um, so I'm going to talk about sarcopenia, and I'm going to talk about sarcopenia particularly in solid organ transplant recipients. Um, this is a, a talk um, that's incorporated some slides um, of a presentation I was asked to give um, to Transplant 2 uh, in Belgium in February, um, but I'm also going to add in a few other bits and pieces um, about uh, how we look at muscle in particular. Um, so I thought I'd start with a little bit about me. Um, as I said, I'm a, a postdoc research um, associate with the Leicester Kidney Lifestyle Team at the University of Leicester. I have a background in sport and exercise science um, from the University of Birmingham. Um, I then went on to do my PhD looking at a condition called rheumatoid cachexia, uh, essentially a form of muscle wasting in patients with rheumatoid arthritis. Um, this was it started in 2012, so a few years after, Bang uh, after Zoe had actually graduated uh, from Bangor herself. I'm a member of um, the organising committee of the recently formed Global Renal Exercise Group. So if you are interested in exercise and physical activity in renal uh, patients, I know there's a, a little bit of research that you guys do down there, um, then please check out the website and, and subscribe to the mailing list. I, um, I met uh, Zoe through Twitter, um, as you do these days. Um, but then later in person as part of the Exercise and Lifestyle Clinical Study Group um, in, in London. So the presentation I'm going to give is um, going to cover a couple of different topics all around sarcopenia. So I'm going to talk about what sarcopenia is, how we define it, how we assess it, the causes of sarcopenia uh, and how this is relevant to patients with a transplant. I'm then going to move on to talk about muscle quality and this concept of muscle quality and whether actually this is something that we should be looking at rather than muscle mass. And then I'm going to look at uh, and talk about some pharmacological contributions um, that I or data suggests is actually accelerating sarcopenia in this patient group. Um, and then finally, I'm going to finish with what can we do? So Sarcopenia comes from the Greek phrase meaning poverty of flesh and it was originally described in the late 1980s as an age-related decrease in skeletal muscle mass. But really this the definition of sarcopenia is evolving, it's constantly changing and in my opinion is marked by three key milestones over the last decade or so. The first one was in 2010, where this idea of muscle function um, came into the definition and its importance rather than just muscle mass alone. Um, and this addition of muscle function made its way into six of the different consensus definitions. In 2016, sarcopenia was recognised as an independent muscle disease given uh, and given its own ICD-10 code. And just last year, um, in the new um, criteria, the new definition, there was this switch to muscle function as the key criteria when we're actually defining uh, sarcopenia. So the most widely used criteria is proposed by the European Working Group on Sarcopenia in Older People. And like I said, this was updated in 2019. Uh, and for this, they proposed four steps. First, we need to find cases. We need to identify patients at risk of sarcopenia. We need to assess the presence of sarcopenia and confirm whether a person has it. And then we can grade its severity. Um, and this grading severity and the confirmation of sarcopenia will help guide uh, how we manage this patient and what type of interventions we might need to, to administer. 
Um, and they came up with this schematic, um, which is really nice to follow, um, uh, and how we kind of would take a person through um, defining something with sarcopenia. So first of all, we need to find people at risk. Um, this could be through clinical judgment, but they advocate the use of this SARC-F questionnaire. This is a simple five item questionnaire um, and asks whether patients can do quite simple things like can you get out of a chair, can you climb the stairs. Once we have somebody who potentially is at risk of sarcopenia we need to um, assess, it, uh, assess them and this is done as I said through a measure of muscle function rather than muscle mass initially um, and this is usually a measure of grip strength uh, and they propose different cutoffs for both men and women. Once we have uh, somebody with uh, sarcopenia uh, we can then confirm its presence by measuring their muscle mass and particularly their appendicular skeletal muscle mass relative to either their height um, but the Asian um, working group also advocate adjusting this to BMI, so height and weight. Um, and again, different cutoffs can be used for men and women. In these patients with confirmed sarcopenia, we then can grade its severity, and this is uh, assessed by its effect on physical performance. So, this could be something like a gait speed test or a timed up and go test, chair stand test. There's lots of different ones we can use. Again, different cutoffs will help us determine uh, whether somebody has poor or um, uh, okay physical uh, functioning. And you can see in the right hand side of the, the schematic, depending on where the patient is, will um, guide us how we potentially manage or, or when we need to start um, interfering uh, with this patient. Now there are lots of causes of sarcopenia, but these can broadly be um, grouped into primary and secondary factors. So primary factors are primarily age related. So this is when there's no other specific cause that's evident. And then we have secondary causes. So this is when there are causal factors other than, or in addition to aging, which are present. And for these, there are lots of, uh, lots of them. These are, um, broadly grouped into nutritional components, uh, inactivity components, so either being sedentary by choice or um, being sedentary uh, through immobility um, or bed rest. There are disease specific factors and then there are other factors such as um, the effects of drugs which I'm going to talk to you a bit about later. When we think about a transplant patient, we also might have what I've called accelerators. So particularly nutritional um, and inactivity components from um, the, the surgery and the hospitalization process, but also things like increased inflammation, reductions in testosterone and reductions in IGF-1. Uh, and like I said, in transplant patients particularly, you also have these, these drug-related um, factors. Whilst I'm not going to talk too much about obesity in this presentation, I think it's also worth noting that obesity, through various different mechanisms, can actually increase the rate of muscle loss, as well as being a very independent, um, abhorrent body composition trait to have. So what actually happens when we have a transplant? So this is some data taken from kidney transplant patients, but... Um, there's some couple of references at the bottom in liver transplant patients which um, show almost the um, identically the same data. So on the left hand side you have muscle mass, body fat percentage and then BMI and you have um, the time after and before transplantation on the x-axis. So this is two days before surgery all the way up to one year. And what you can see is that at 12 months post-transplant patients have lost a significant amount of muscle mass, given us this sarcopenic phenotype. They've gained fat mass, potentially becoming obese. But what's interesting and what's more important is actually their BMI doesn't change. So the weight on the scales doesn't change, but actually their body composition has changed quite significantly. And this potentially gives us our sarcopenic obesity phenotype.
Um, and, and it's this phenotype, particularly the one where the weight of the BMI doesn't change, which is the one that gets under-recognized um, and under-reported. So why is this important? Well, unsurprisingly, both preoperative and postoperative sarcopenia is associated with a range of different adverse events, including risk of decompensation, uh, postoperative complications, increased hospital stay and mortality. This is a, a study done in liver transplant patients. Um, you can see here that if you had sarcopenia pre-transplant, you were 16% um, or you had a 16% reduction in survival after 60 months. What's important here is that 15% of patients actually developed sarcopenia during the, the surgery, the hospitalization period. And when you took those patients who had recently developed sarcopenia, they did just as worse as those with pre-transplant sarcopenia. I'm going to spend the next um, five, ten minutes talking about muscle quality uh, and whether we should actually be measuring muscle quality as standard alongside um, muscle quantity or muscle size. Now, it's logical to think that if you increase your muscle size, you increase physical performance and strength. But actually, the data showing that, particularly in clinical exercise studies, is quite limited. And certainly in a CKD and in a kidney population, which is uh, what my research is focused on, there really is a lack of evidence behind that. And although you can increase muscle size and you can increase physical performance through exercise interventions, actually they are very, um, they're, they're not often related. Um, so the increases in physical performance and increases in strength occur independently to increases in muscle size. Um, there's data to show that in, in older adults as well. Some of you will be familiar with the Health ABC study. This is a large cohort study in America. Um, and you can see here that when they followed up um, older adults over a period of three years, lean mass or muscle mass was relatively consistent, but actually their strength declined uh, much, much quicker uh, and much more uh, substantial. Um, than, than the decrease in, in muscle size. You also see the same patterns in clinical populations. This is a study in uh, hemodialysis patients. Um, and you can see here, this is six minute walk difference between uh, HD and non-HD patients. And even when you adjust for muscle size, there still is a substantial difference between um, physical performance in these patients. And a similar um, pattern is seen in older adults as well. Um, this is a quote from that Health ABC study. It says that in addition to muscle quantity, muscle quality may also be an important determinant of muscle strength with aging. So when we talk about muscle quality, this is quite a subjective term. And actually, no universal definition exists. When we think about muscle quality, we can think about the muscle architecture, how the fibers are put together, the composition of the muscle, its metabolism, the presence of fibrosis, and even its neuromuscular activation. These are all different factors that influence muscle quality. Now, one factor, um, the infiltration of uh, intramuscular fat or myostatosis, uh, has emerged as quite an important factor un underpinning muscle quality. Um, and this is a, a, a sentence taken from the, the European Working Group uh, of Sarcopenia and Older People, the revised criteria from last year. It says, in the future, assessment of muscle quality are expected to help guide treatment choices and monitor response to treatment. Now, just like they don't have a definition of muscle quality, uh, we also don't have a standard way of measuring muscle quality. In Leicester and in uh, lots of other different studies in clinical groups, muscle quality uh, can be evaluated using ultrasound. So those who've used ultrasound for musculoskeletal imaging research or in clinical practice before will know that it's very non-invasive, it's quite accessible and it's extremely low cost. It's a lot more tolerable to patients than things like DEXA 
uh, where you're exposing patients to risk of radiation or something like an MRI scan, which can be very costly. Now, from a, an ultrasound scan, we can get something called echo intensity. So this echo intensity represents um, potentially increased intramuscular adipose tissue or intramuscular fibrosis. Um, and this echo intensity has been validated against MRI, including, uh, including in the rectus femoris, so the, in the quadricep muscle, um, for a measure of intramuscular fat. There's lots of research to show in older adults that this echo intensity also relates to strength and physical performance of the muscle. So these are a few different studies um, that have looked at the relationship between echo intensity and various physical performance tests. So um, the higher the echo intensity value, the poorer the muscle, the higher the fat, the higher the fibrosis, the lower the echo intensity, the more lean tissue, the more muscle. So you can see that the higher the echo intensity, generally the poorer the strength, the poorer the force production, uh, and the poorer the physical performance in terms of sit to stands. And this uh, panel on the right hand side is each of the four different quadricep muscles. So it's consistent across all these different muscle groups. So we did a, a study last year when we looked at the contribution of muscle quantity and muscle quality and how this associates with physical performance in kidney patients. So we used um, B-mode ultrasound imaging to look at the cross-sectional area of the rectus femoris muscle. Um, and to do this, um, we, we uh, take a, an image of the, the rectus femoris, a cross-section, um, which looks like some of this on the left-hand side. This is an image from one of our patients. So you have the skin at the top, you then have a layer of subcutaneous fat, um, which can range from very, very small um, to, to quite substantial uh, amounts. And in some patients, it can almost take up half the image. You then have this upper aprochronosis, and then you have this, um, this kind of liver-shaped uh, muscle, which is the rectus femoris. And this is uh, surrounded by the different vastus muscles, and those four make up the quadriceps. Um, so often if they have a very um, thin layer of subcutaneous fat um, and a relatively small muscle, um, you can then start to see the femur, uh, which would be at the bottom of the image. So what we do then is we draw around the rectus femoris muscle to give us our cross-sectional area. And we can do that in situ or we can do it um, on software after. And then we run this through um, an image J software and you get uh, a histogram of the gray scale. Um, so in our histogram here, this is what we would say is a good muscle. So on the left hand side of the histogram, um, the more darker images, the more darker areas, sorry, that's muscle, that's lean tissue. And the more white images, that's fat and fibrotic tissue. And you can see on this image here that there's a heavy bank towards the left-hand side. So this is um, more muscle, more lean tissue. This is a, 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 an image from one of our patients, as is this. So this is what we would say is a, a bad muscle. Um, you can just about make out the oval of the rectus femoris muscle, but you can see there's a substantial more signal, and this could be more fat and fibrotic tissue, and that is shown in the histogram here. Um, what you can also do is subjectively rate uh, an image, and this is used in using something called the Heckmat scale. So we did this as well. Um, and the Heckmat scales are a grade from one to four, one being the best, four being the worst. And there's certain criteria that you look out for. Um, but you can see on the, the grade one image in the top left hand corner, um, you can quite clearly see the rectus femoris muscle. You can actually see the femur at the bottom. And then as you go to grade four, you can we start to lose that, that clear uh, image of the muscle. And what's quite nice is when we did this, this subjective grading matches really nicely with the echo intensity. Um, so grade one um, has a low echo intensity and grade four has a much higher echo intensity. 
So we had a, a look at how echo intensity maps against physical performance. Um, this is the sit to stand 60 test. I'm sure some of you will be familiar with this. This is how many um, sit to stand repetitions they can do in one minute. The higher, the better. And you can see here that when we plot this on a graph, you get this linear relationship. So the higher the echo intensity, the more fat and fibrotic tissue, the poorer the, the, the test score. The lower the echo intensity, the more muscle, the better the score. And this is consistent across a lot of different physical performance tests, including the shuttle walk uh, and VO2 peak. Interestingly, you don't really see this uh, relationship with gait speed. Um, and certainly you don't see it with hand grip strength, which is probably unsurprising given that we're measuring quadricep uh, muscle. But overall, the poorer the muscle quality, the poorer the physical function. When we used regression to explore the variance in function explained by the cross-sectional area or echo intensity, what we found was, apart from the shuttle walk test, was that echo intensity and cross-sectional area were both important. They both explain some proportion of the variance in the test score. Uh, but that was only um, evident for a few of the tests. When we looked at uh, correlation coefficients between cross-sectional areas, so size and performance, you, as expected, we saw um, a, a significant, not a huge relationship, but we saw a significant relationship between cross-sectional area and, and a few of these tests, such as the SIDSAN 60. But what was interesting is when we added e echo intensity as a covariate, so when we adjusted for the quality of the muscle, it didn't really affect the relationship potentially suggesting that you can you can override having poor muscle quality if it's big big enough so why is poor echo intensity or poor muscle quality associated with physical performance so whilst this supports older research and older adults the mechanisms is is quite unclear there is some research to show that fat infiltration um, potentially can alter alter fibre orientation uh, and reduced elasticity. Um, there is also some suggestion that fat infiltration can impair mitochondrial metabolism. This reduces the oxidative capacity of the muscle, reduces its physical uh, functioning. And when we look at fibrosis, because remember echo intensity doesn't tell us whether it's fat or fibrosis, it just tells us it's not muscle. If it is fibrosis, then the fibrotic tissue can actually increase the stiffness of the muscle and reduce its inability to contract properly. So why is this important in CKD? Why is it important in clinical populations? Well, myostatosis is associated with overall body fat and obesity, but also diabetes. And when we had a look at this, you can see in the graph that echo intensity is correlated quite nicely with overall body fat percentage. So patients who are obese, they're carrying more body fat, are more likely to have increased uh, myostatosis in the muscle. But we also know that myostatosis, myostatosis is associated with um, physical inactivity and also increased levels of inflammation. And like I said, we don't know whether it's fat. It could be um, fibrotic tissue. We know that skeletal muscle fibrosis is common in CKD and this is potentially due to increased myostatin levels driving fibro and um, apo, uh, adipogenic progenitor cells. Um, and hopefully um, in the next couple of months um, using MRI scans we have we'll start to be able to unpick whether the ultrasound is picking up fibrotic tissue or fat tissue. Okay, so I'm going to spend the last bit of the talk talking about how medications that are commonly given to patients, particularly transplant patients, may actually be interfering with um, these mechanistic pathways that are contributing to sarcopenia and obesity development. And these uh, are broadly split into two classes of uh, drugs. These are corticosteroids and calcineurin inhibitors. Now, corticosteroids are widely used to prevent acute rejection. They have huge immunosuppressive effects, uh, are very anti-inflammatory. Uh, uh, the graph, or the table on the right-hand side, I should say, gives you an idea of um, typical kidney 
um, transplant guidelines. So immediately post-surgery, a patient may be given a, quite a, uh, a big IV dose of steroids. And then these are slowly tapered over uh, the remaining um, uh, four to kind of 15 weeks um, down towards about five milligrams. But patients can be kept on um, five milligrams or higher for months and sometimes even years. Um, it's also important to say that steroids like this aren't just given to transplant recipients, they're also given um, to uh, rheumatic disease populations as well, particularly rheumatoid arthritis groups. And we know that if you take steroids for a long time, there are uh, known side effects. And 60% of patients develop something called steroid-induced muscle myopathy. And this presents as weakness, um, primarily of the lower extremities, so the arms, the legs. Uh, it weakens uh, muscles of the hip and the shoulders, making um, things like falls uh, much more common. When we look at the muscle more closely, we see a decline in myofibral mass, um, reductions in mitochondrial volume and decreased capillary number. Um, so these high doses, which are often given to people at the start of their treatment, these have quite profound effects in a very short amount of time. So this is a study um, from a few years ago now, but this was 19 patients with different um, uh, clinical um, characteristics, different disease um, backgrounds, but they were all given a, an IV uh, dose of steroids followed by a very high dose of oral treatment. And this was for eight weeks. And you can see in this eight weeks, they lost a significant amount of muscle and gained quite a lot of body fat. And the authors concluded this wasn't just due to the hospitalization uh, period or the disease alone. This is data from five healthy adults, and this is oral use, uh, five milligrams per day um, of um, steroids. And you can see here that just in seven days, there was a significant loss of cross-sectional area, and but also a significant reduction in muscle function in terms of their strength. What about when we look at low doses? So it was considered and generally thought that myopathy was quite rare in doses of less than 7.5 milligrams of prednisolone equivalent. But recent data is starting to challenge that a little bit. This was a study um, from a few months ago in rheumatoid arthritis patients. And what you can see here is that patients who had been maintained on a steroid uh, dose of 3.3 milligrams per day were almost nine times more likely to have developed sarcopenia uh, 12 months later. We know that a steroid dose, dose goes up, uh, generally strength and muscle function goes down. So the um, relationship between steroid use and muscle function is dose dependent. Uh, and I'm not going to go too much into the, the mechanisms why this might occur, but steroids can affect various different pathways that are responsible for protein synthesis and protein degradation. Really uh, key to, 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 to the growth of muscle and, and the breakdown of muscle is the IGF-1 AKT pathway. Um, we know, and there's data to show that steroids actually inhibit the production of IGF-1. This is the main stimulus of this pathway. They accelerate IRS-1 protein degradation. Uh, so this is a key component of the, the AKT pathway. They reduce AKT phosphorylation, and they can increase protein degradation through increased, increased ubiquitin ligase activity. It's also been shown that they potentially can inhibit myogenesis. So this is the formation of new muscle, and particularly new uh, myotubes, by down-regulating myogenin gene expression. Now, one of the most notable, notable effects of steroid use is actually the redistribution of body fat. Some of you will be aware of um, terms such as moon face and buffalo hump. Now, the effect on fat mass is actually seen with both high and low dose steroid use. And low dose prednisolone is actually associated with an increased mean body weight of around about 4 to 8% over a period of 24 months. And there's lots of different mechanisms for this again, but actually one of the main ones is actually just an increased um, appetite and increased food intake that you get from, from being on steroids.
Okay, so another class of drugs that patients, uh, particularly transplant patients, get are calcineurin inhibitors. So intramuscular calcium levels, which activate calcineurin, have a really important role in um, muscle growth and muscle maintenance. So by inhibiting calcineurin, you actually may disrupt these processes. Um, and in rat models, um, a drug called cyclosporin, which is a calcineurin inhibitor, has been shown to upregulate different pathways responsible for protein breakdown, but it also may actually reduce mitochondrial function in the muscle, which will reduce its oxidative capacity and reduce its um, its functionality. Another common drug uh, is tacrolimus. Um, tacrolimus has been uh, reported to increase uh, increase energy expenditure resulting in this quite hypermetabolic um, environment. Um, this actually might uh, impair uh, skeletal muscle uh, remodeling after transplantation. Uh, and again, recent data from, from rats show that tacrolimus can actually induce muscle atrophy. So uh, on the right-hand side, you can see some staining images from the control group and the tacrolimus group of the quadriceps and the gastroc. And then underneath you have the cross-sectional area of the quadricep, which is significantly reduced compared to a control group. And the authors actually thought this might be due to some kind of tacrolimus-associated um, induction of diabetes. Um, so what can we do? This is my last slide. Um, so the, the first one is really trying to identify people with sarcopenia. Um, and trying to stick to a consistent means of, uh, of identifying patients and assessing patients. And that criteria that I went through at the start really helps to do that, helps us identify those at risk, uh, assess and confirm patients with sarcopenia, and then grade its severity. Um, and a lot of this in exercise and physical activity research will be doing a lot of these tests anyway. Um, particularly in clinical populations, things like chair stands are very common. Um, so by adding in a measure of muscle, uh, we can also then start to categorise people as sarcopenic or not. And now in terms of a treatment, really the best thing we can do is, is encourage our patients to exercise. And we know that strength and resistance training is key to this. Um, and there's been lots of studies to show that resistance training can actually help um, prevent and delay um, steroid-induced myopathy in different um, clinical populations. Um, how we encourage our patients to engage with this form of exercise is very difficult, um, and particularly what we've seen over the past few months with uh, being at home is maybe there's a lot more scope for home-based um, exercise routines, and that's something that we're um, we're doing in Leicester uh, is trying to develop. Um, kind of an optimal resistance training program at home, but also trying to get people to understand and trying to educate patients of why this is so important, okay? Why going for a walk just simply isn't enough. Um, and then if we are using steroids, um, we, the, you know, the evidence just suggests that less than five milligrams is going to have less of an effect on muscle, but we know that it is also going to have effect on, on things like fat mass. Um, so it's really trying to use our, our steroid um, uh, medication appropriately. So I'd just like to thank you very much for listening or watching or however um, uh, you viewed the presentation. Um, looking forward to the, the Q&A, um, which is next week. Um, um, I'm happy to share these slides with anybody who'd like a copy. Please email me. Uh, my email's on the screen. Um, and I'm also on Twitter. Um, so um, feel free to follow me on there. Um, so thanks very much um, for listening and um, or watching. And I look forward to speaking to you all soon.